this chapter is all about different types of bonding theories. And the molecular orbital theory really tries to explain the energetics about why things bond. So we haven't really looked at that before. So if you think back to the beginning of the chapter, we talked about quantum mechanics. Actually, I don't even remember what chapter. It may have been chapter six. We looked at describing orbitals in terms of uh, wave equations. So waves are things like sines and cosines. And so you can put all these fancy wave equations together and you can describe the orbital um, in, in those, you know, mathematically. So when waves, if you think about, um, and you probably learned about this maybe in physics, when waves uh, interact, they can inter interact constructively or destructively. So constructively, when you add, them t add the two of them together, they can get lower in energy. Or if there's a destructive interference, then um, it's going to get higher in energy. So for bonding, you, a bond is going to happen when the orbitals um, combine in a um, constructive manner so that the energy is lower. And then an antibonding orbital is a non-bonding orbital, and that's when the um, overlap happens and it's um, higher in energy. So in this picture above, what we're doing is taking two s orbitals, and when you combine two s atomic orbitals, um, when you start to have make a molecule and you make bonding orbitals, you get one that's higher in energy and one that's lower in energy. So you're going to take your two s orbitals, and I'll take one on each side here. S orbital here, S orbital here. Those are my two atomic orbitals. And when they combine, I'm going to get two molecular orbitals. One's going to be higher in energy and one's going to be lower in energy. So this is a 1s orbital. That's an atomic orbital. This is a 1s atomic orbital. And then my molecular orbitals are up here. Molecular happens when you start adding atomic orbitals together. And I call this one a sigma 1s and then a sigma star. Now, if I had two electrons in here, I had one from this s orbital and I had one from this s orbital, I'm going to start filling up those electrons in the molecular orbital, so the ones in the middle. So when they come together, I get one here and one here. So what happened was I took these two s orbitals, which are, you know, the, think about this in terms of energy, right? These are about mid-level energy. When I combine them, when I'm adding up these two atomic orbitals make molecular orbitals, I get one that's lower in energy, one that's higher in energy. Because I only have two electrons, I can put both of them into this lower energy orbital. And so the end, that's, that's basically explaining why do these two atoms, why would they rather get together? Because when they get together, they can form atomic, molecular orbitals that are lower in energy. And that's a more favorable energetic state. We can then calculate the bond order. So again, think about this as like a hydrogen atom has, has a 1s electron, another hydrogen atom has a 1s electron. If you put those together, if you were to draw the Lewis structure, you know it looks like that. You know you have a single bond. What we can do is we can calculate the bond order. And the bond order is half of the number of bonding electrons minus the non-bonding electrons. So if I look at this, this diagram over here, I have two electrons in bonding orbitals. So I would say this is one half of two, and I don't have any non-bonding um, electrons over there in the antibonding orbital. So that's two minus zero is two, half of two is one. So that means I have a bond order of one, which means I have a single bond. We can do the same thing for something like He2. All right, so let's look at the atomic orbitals of He2, right, and try to figure out, you know, what's the bond order? Does this thing want a bond? Um, so I have helium over here, I have a helium over here, I have two helium atoms. Right, and they're going to bond, and I have, these are both 1s orbitals, and helium has two electrons, I have two electrons over here, and when they bond, when these orbitals, um, 1s orbitals combine, I get one that's higher in energy, and one that's lower in energy, so this is my sigma, this is my sigma star, star means it's going to be higher in energy, I'm going to take, I have four electrons, and I'm going to put them in my, um, molecular orbitals. So I put two here and two here. And so we're looking at He2. And if you might, we might be thinking, wait, wait, wait. Helium doesn't like to bond with other helium. Like helium likes to be all by itself. So why does helium like to be by itself? Let's calculate the bond order. We have a one half of, I have two um, bonding orbital uh, electrons and I have two non-bonding electrons. One half of two minus two, right? That's zero. So it's zero. So that means I have a bond order of zero, which means this thing does not like to bond, which is something that we already knew. So looking at this uh, molecular orbital theory, you know, why, how does this explain that? 
there's no benefit in these two atoms coming together because I'm, now I'm occupying a lower orbital, but I also have to put electrons in this higher energy orbital. So they're like, we would just rather be by ourselves. There's no net you know, gain in uh, energetic stability by forming a bond. So helium would rather just be by itself. So that's how molecular orbital theory kind of explains um, the energy of bonding. So for, heli for hydrogen, right, when these two um, single hydrogen atoms come together to form a bond, they can occupy a lower energy orbital. But for helium, they have to occupy this higher energy orbital because you can only put two electrons in an orbital. Uh, so it doesn't make any sense for helium to bond to other heliums. So that's what energy level one looks like, right? We only have two, two atoms there, hydrogen and helium. What happens when you get to that, um, that second, second row where you have now S and P electrons um, coming together? So remember there's three different ways that P orbitals can overlap. P orbitals can overlap um, side to side here uh, or end to end. So we have two sideways overlaps and one end. These are, remember, pi overlaps. This is, these are like forming pi bonds. And then we have a sigma bond. So when two, uh, when p orbitals overlap, you can, when, what do I want to say? When three p orbitals are overlapping, you can get a sigma and two pi's. Um, or we can look at this, let me, so this is a sigma overlap. And then this is a pi and this is a pi. So if I had three p orbitals from one atom and three p orbitals from another atom, right? I have three and three, so I'm going to have six total orbitals. Um, what's going to happen when the these interact? I'm going to form, you know, I'm going to have three that are lower in energy and three that are higher in energy. Um, so I might get something like pi pi sigma and pi pi sigma. This is a possibility. So this is sigma pi. This is pi star and sigma star. So this what's happening in the middle here is I'm taking these p orbitals from the, the atoms. These are atomic orbitals and I'm combining them to form molecular orbitals. So when I form a bond, this is what's happening and they're going to split out into different energy levels. And actually it turns out, depending on what um, period two elements you're talking about, they have a different form. They have a, this might look a little bit different. So you don't have to memorize this. You're not going to have to draw these diagrams. I'm going to give them to you. You have to know what these mean. So if there's a single line there, it's always either sigma or sigma star. Sigma, um, the stars are always going to be higher in energy than the other ones, um, than the non-stars. But what can change is this top, this top part. Sometimes the pi star and the sigma star switch places depending on um, how many electrons you have filling them up. So they can kind of switch places. The energetics gets kind of tricky there. You're always going to start off whether you have you know boron, carbon, nitrogen. This is just again looking at that row two. The in energy level two, you have s orbitals and you have p orbitals, right? So the s orbitals are always going to combine with the sigma and sigma star, and then the p orbitals. It depends. Sometimes it goes uh, pi sigma pi star sigma, or sometimes it's uh, sigma pi pi sigma with the stars on top. So every every other one, every other um, p orbital is a, what do I want to say, star. So I will give you these diagrams, but I won't label the, um, the blocks. So if there's two blocks here, that means it's pi, because pi, um, p orbitals can overlap in two degenerate pi um, overlaps. It means they have the same energy. Uh, sigma is only one, so there's only one way that pi or p orbitals can overlap to form sigma uh, or sigma star. Right, that's that head-to-head um, -head con uh, head -head overlap, but the side-to-side, -side, there's two ways because you're in two dimensions, uh, two different, the, the x and the y plane. So then you start filling in the electrons. So B2 has how many electrons? Six, because you have, bor each boron has three valence, again, we're only looking at valence electrons, so each boron has um, three, so you have six total, so then you start plugging them in here, two, four, and then five, six. So half fill these before you pair them up. Uh, carbon, you can do the same thing. Carbon has eight, right? C2 would have eight, so two, four, six, eight. And again, half fill before you pair. And then um, you do it for oxygen now. Now what's going to happen is, uh, uh, sorry, these two, these two switch. These bottom two we're switching. 
I think I said that wrong in the other video. It's these bottom two that can switch places. Um, the top are the same. So sigma, sigma star, pi, sigma, pi star, sigma star. So if they're higher in energy, then they're going to have the stars. If they're lower in energy, they don't have stars um, for the for the overlap. Again, this bottom part, these two sigmas down here are from an overlap of uh, two s orbitals. And then you have, so think about s, and then you have, whoop, we kind of showed it above. So then what do we have? Um, we can count up the number of unpaired electrons. So you can see that uh, oxygen has two unpaired electrons, um, but everybody else, the, all the uh, in, in boron has unpaired electrons, right? Single, they're, there's not, they're not paired. Everybody else has all their electrons um, paired. So that's the difference between being uh, paramagnetic and diamagnetic. Diamagnetic means there's no unpaired electrons, so no unpaired electrons. Um, but for para, if you um, if something exhibits paramagnetism, um, then it has one or more unpaired electrons. One or more unpaired electrons. So oxygen is paramagnetic, uh, and B2 is uh, paramagnetic. And you can watch this video. You can click on this and watch this video. Um, it's a magnet showing how you can have paramagnetism.